Good evening and welcome to the Indiana University Cinema's Virtual Screening Room. I'm Brittany Friesner, the Cinema's Interim Director. To begin tonight's program, we would like to acknowledge that IU Cinema is built and operates upon the ancestral lands of the indigenous peoples of the Miami, the Potawatomi, the Shawnee, and the Delaware nations. We are grateful to work on this land and implore each of you to reflect on the land from which you're watching tonight. We say it each and every week, but it doesn't diminish the sentiment. We miss you, and we are so appreciative you continue to connect and engage with us through our online events. We're overwhelmed by the support from our extended IU Cinema family and for all of you who share your time, treasures, and talents with us. IU Cinema's achievements to date, to date are the culmination of many people's contributions. Together, we have created a place for film like no other. This week is Thank a Donor Week at IU, and we're celebrating all who support Indiana University. We want to express our eternal gratitude to each and every one of IU Cinema's donors. Thank you for making possible transformative cinematic experiences for all. And thank you for joining us tonight for a conversation on the 2019 documentary, Memorias Afro-Atlanticus, directed by Gabriela Barreto. We hope you've all had a chance to view the film before tonight's conversation, which is presented in partnership with IU's Institute for Advanced Study. The format of tonight's program will be an extended conversation between our distinguished guests. And after about 45 minutes, we'll begin answering questions from the audience. Please feel free to type your questions in the Q&A box at any time, which you can find by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. To introduce tonight's panel and panelists, we welcome Associate Director of IU's Institute for Advanced Study, Suzanne Godby Inglesby. Suzanne, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Brittany. Thank you, Seth and Will and everyone at IU Cinema who's making this possible. And thanks to all of you for joining us for the IU Institute for Advanced Studies Fall 2020 Brannigan Lecture. As Brittany said, I'm Suzanne Godby Inglesby, the Institute's Associate Director, and it's my pleasure to welcome you. The Brannigan Lecture Series is made possible by an endowment from IU Bloomington alumna Jean Lois Porteous Brannigan. Her gift was designated to bring distinguished scholars, artists, and public figures from all fields to stimulate our community's creative vitality. That's certainly what we're doing tonight. Right now, bringing speakers to campus looks a bit different, but this online format allows us to connect with people all over the world. I feel confident that Mrs. Brannigan would approve. It's particularly appropriate that we're holding this conversation today on November 20th, because this is Black Consciousness Day in Brazil. This evening's program is also made possible by our collaboration with several co-sponsors. We thank, first of all, our colleagues at IU Cinema for arranging the film streaming and making the format of this conversation possible. We also thank the Archives of Traditional Music, Black Film Center Archive, Center for Documentary Research and Practice, Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies, Center for Research on Race and Ethnicity in Society, Center for the Study of Global Change, IU Arts and Humanities Council, and the IU Libraries as well as the departments of African Studies, Anthropology, Folklore and Ethnomusicology, and Religious Studies for their generous and enthusiastic support. Tonight's conversation, as Brittany mentioned, will center on the new documentary, Afro-Atlantic Legacies, which revisits Black American linguist Lorenzo Dal Turner's work in the Candomblés of Bahia in the 1940s. We're fortunate to have the film's director, as well as the scholars and filmmakers who conceived this project joining us this evening. I'll introduce them momentarily, along with two of my IU Bloomington colleagues. First though, we'd like to share the film's trailer, Afro-Atlantic Legacies. Uma reza de Oxóssi em Angola, o Joãozinho da Goméia, Bahia. O Dunda cura, cura, eu e eu e O Dunda cura, cura, eu e eu e O Cabral, eu e eu e O 
Ô Dunda, cura, cura, eu is, eu is. Cantamos igualzinho, do mesmo jeito. Pode contar essa? Essas cantigas, a gente, quando canta, naturalmente são invocadas algumas energias. Deixa elas quietas. O Pedra Preta é um rei, que nas matas mora. Ou oh, venha ver seus filhos, que tanto lhe adoram. A importância é poder resgatar a memória do povo de Santo. É poder dizer para a sociedade brasileira, temos uma história. Uma história que veio trazida nos navios negreiros é, e que a gente lutou durante décadas, durante gerações para manter. Quando se começa o canomblé, canta primeiro para Exu, a poder abrir os caminhos, abrir as estradas. Bom, bom, gira, jacundando, ai, ai, orerê, bom, bom, gira, jacundando. Bom, bom, gira, mungando, jaju, bom, bom, gira, jamungangue, ai, ai, orelê, bom, bom, gira, jamungangue, ai, ai, orelê. Essa é a grande importância do trabalho de termo, mostrar que essas línguas foram faladas, que essas línguas sobreviveram e que o brasileiro não se interessa por estudar línguas africanas simplesmente porque são línguas de oralidade e o que não é escrito em letras não tem legitimidade, não é legítimo. Tessara, ele fazia um registro, uma memória, mas ele não imaginou o que isso ia impactar nos dias de hoje o que essas fotos, o que esses registros impactar no século XXI, uhum. né? E mostrar essas figuras que hoje pode servir, claro, de exemplo para a gente, né? Principalmente para o povo negro, para o povo do santo. O Babalorixá Manoel Falefá diz em Jeje a alegria de vencer a guerra por cantiga. O chuque, molho que, só vou de deitar no zacatamé, só vou de deitar no zacatamé, meu pere que vai cantar no zacatamé. O chuque, molho que, só vou de deitar no zacatamé. Gente, pra mim é uma memória viva. Em mim eu sempre tive, meu pai não morreu, meu pai sempre teve vivo dentro de mim. Isso pra mim tá me mostrando que ele tá mais vivo do que nunca. Para mim, a minha sensação é que eu volto no tempo, não é? Volto no tempo onde eu ainda não tinha nem nascido, mas o meu DNA já estava no, no, no universo. E faz com que eu sou quase contemporânea de muitos deles em pontos diferentes da vida. Aê, a, vou de um epostador, vou de um epostidacaiá, Vou do epositador, aê, a, vou do epositador, vou do epositador, vou do romé, vou do epositador, aê, a, vou do epositador, vou do epositador, caia, vou do epositador, aê, a, vou do epositador, vou do epositador, romé, vou do epositador. Aí, a vou do impositado. O Vodum está aqui presente entre todos nós.
Now, I'm delighted to introduce those who will be taking part in this conversation. Gabriela Barreto is a young Black Brazilian award-winning director. Her work is focused on social and environmental aspects of a Brazilian society with an emphasis on Afro-Brazilian culture. She is the director of Afro-Atlantic Legacies, a project she joined in 2017. Welcome, Gabriela. Thank you so much for joining us. Xavier? Welcome, good evening. Xavier Vatan is an ethnomusicologist and the originator and coordinator of the Afro-Atlantic Legacies Project. He has a PhD in ethnomusicology from the School for Advanced Studies in Social Sciences, Paris, under the supervision of Professor Simha Arom. Dr. Vatan started his research on Candomblé in 1992, mentored by French anthropologist and photographer Pierre Fatoumi Verguet. He is Associate Professor of Anthropology at Reconcavo Federal University, Bahia, Brazil. His research is focused on Afro-Brazilian religions and Afro-Atlantic cultures and languages. In 2019, he was an IAS Summer Repository Research Fellow at IU's Archives of Traditional Music. Thank you for being with us, Xavier. Mm -hmm. Boa noite. Good night, everyone. Cassio Nobre is a musician as well as a music and album producer. He is director at Coresa Cultural Creations and executive producer of Afro-Atlantic Legacies. He has a bachelor's degree in history and PhD in ethnomusicology, both from the Federal University of Bahia, Brazil. His research is focused on Afro-Brazilian music, phonographic production, and tangible heritage. Along with Xavier Vatin, he participated in the 2019 Summer Repository Research Program. Welcome back, Cassio. Thank you. Good evening to you all. Maria Hamilton Abagunde is a memory keeper, poet, and ancestral priest in the Yorba Orisha tradition. Her research and creative work respectfully approach the earth and human bodies as sites of memory and always with the understanding that memory never dies, is subversive, and can be recovered to transform transgenerational trauma and pain into peace and power. Her research on the power and roles of women in Igungun ancestral society in Itaparica, Brazil, laid the foundation for her dissertation and memory work, The Ariran's Last Life, as well as her current commissioned works for the Ancestral Masquerade series, including the collaborative community exhibitions, Be Coming, Keeper of My Mother's Dreams, and Sister Song, The Requiem. I'm glad you've joined us, Abagunde. Thank you so much for this evening. Solimar Otero is Professor of Folklore in the Department of Folklore and Ethnomusicology and Acting Director of Latino Studies at Indiana University. She is also the editor of the Journal of Folklore Research. Her research centers on gender, sexuality, Afro-Caribbean spirituality, and Yoruba traditional religion in folklore, literature, and ethnography. She is the author of Archives of Conjure, Stories of the Dead in Afro-Latinx Cultures, Afro-Cuban Diasporas in the Atlantic World. She is co-editor of Yemoja, Gender, Sexuality, and Creativity in Latina, Latino, and Afro-Atlantic Diasporas, and co-editor of Theorizing Folklore from the Margins, Critical and Ethical Approaches. She's the recipient of a Ruth Landis Memorial Research Fund grant a fellowship at the Harvard Divinity School's Women's Studies in Religion program and a Fulbright Award. Thank you for joining this conversation, Soli. Thank you, Suzanne. Good evening, everybody. We are so happy that all of you are with us and we're eager to hear from all of you. So I'll happily turn this conversation over to you now. Thank you again. Good evening again, everyone. Boa noite, uh, bem-vindo. And it is so wonderful to be here this evening. I want to thank again um, all of you who are here, Suzanne, Brittany, IAS and IU Cinema and um, Solomar um, for us to be here to discuss uh, this very important work. Before starting, I want to acknowledge and give honor to the ancestors, especially those of the African diaspora who've made this evening possible, including the Africans who refused to forget and Dr. Lorenzo Dow Turner, who sought to remember and all of their descendants. 
So we'd like to start by just sharing uh, a little bit of what resonated with us after watching the documentary. Uh, Soli and I had a marvelous time watching this and discussing it, and there's so much here, but I'm just gonna start by sharing some things and then pass it to her, and then we'll then ask one of the many of the 10,000 questions that we have for, for you all. So as someone who was introduced to Dr. Turner's research over two decades ago through the documentary, The Language You Crying, I'm happy that Afro-Atlantic Legacies brings together, brings attention to the work he conducted in Bahia. While a lot stays with me after watching the documentary, I return to three things in particular shaped what, by what an elder in The Language You Cry In says, and that is language is power. You know where a person is from by the language they cry in. And these are the three things that I return to. When Monica hears the recording, she says, this is very present as if more than 70 years do not separate the recordings and her hearing them. And when the children of Baba Falefa say that my father is not dead, this made me think of how language maintains continuity and fluidity between past, present, and future. When descendants talk about how Baba Falefa and others insist that they learn languages and dances of multiple nations to embody and to archive histories and cultural practices, I think too of how Cece says, memory remembers and the body registers. In this way, she acknowledges, as do others in the documentary, that language and the body are sites of intergenerational memory that can identify points of origin and points of departure in the transformation of cultural practices over time and space. And finally, I thought how events of history can make visible the very archives they once made invisible. And for example, Dr. Turner's interdisciplinary approaches made him ahead of his time because what was a black African American man in the 1940s doing? Uh, he began his work two years before Herskovitz, if I remember correctly, and before Pierre Verger began his work. Yet here we are almost 80 years later on this day of black consciousness in Brazil, remembering him as if he began this work yesterday. So I'll stop there and pass to Sully. Thank you so much, Abba Gunde. There's so much there that resonates with, with me. And I want to take this moment as Abba Gunde has done to say modupe, moduba to the ancestors, Igbae, to all the Agbalaba and all the Orishas and, and to this wonderful work that we're celebrating today. Um, and quickly, I do want to thank Suzanne at IAS and also Brittany at IU Cinema and also Abagunde for being um, part of this conversation with me. And of course, uh, uh, Gabriela Barreto, uh, Javier Ratin and Casio Nombre for this wonderful film. Um, I also was introduced to Lorenzo Dow Turner's work through the language you cry and among other, other sources. And I felt that this was such a necessary addition to his work and his conversation, taking us to Brazil, taking us to um, Candomblé and taking that circle between these Afro-Atlantic languages, these black polyglot, not only languages, but traditions. Um, and how these traditions are affect, well, not survivals, but more effectively put continuing and living traditions. You really saw that in the film. And traditions that, that change and endure, but also keep traces of the memories that are so present and alive, as Abu Gunde has said. And there was a quote by Queen Ket um, that really struck me, where she says, we have never been broken in any way. And how there is this knowledge, these archives, these repositories that are full of presence. And they may not be there for the researchers. There is a place for researchers to come in, but there are these repositories in the body, in ritual, in secrecy, that then can touch these traces of Afro-Atlantic legacies. I find that it, what the wonderful work that the three of you did with bringing the archive alive, vivifying these ancestors, bringing this work back to the communities, um, really, really closes that circle and really made me think about the deep connections between memory, ritual, and material culture as well, because the recordings themselves are a, a piece of material culture. So I think that's that's pretty interesting. Um, 
and that the community holds these these as repositories as their own, whether it's the knowledge of how to make ilekes or do the rituals for Papa Legba. Uh, there's all these different components that we see in the film that resonate and it's layered in such a beautiful way. I really was struck by the mutual relationships that were in the film between the ancestors and their voices, the the spirits that were called upon in the film, whether they're caboclos or rishas or um, indoki, and then also the researchers and the community itself. Um, I felt that Cece's song at the end of the film, a very touching moment where she points and she connects all these different, she says, Vodou together. That was something that I said, that's what the film's about. That That is what this movie's about. And it was very touching and very to the point there. And it also seemed to me like a call a further call to action that this work needs to continue between the community and respectful work by researchers as yourself. And I feel that this, um, that this is kind of a testament to as one of the uh, of the of the participants or one of the mice in the Tejero says uh, that uh, the the they're playing drums for God in heaven, right? That this artistry never ends. That this is always part of part of that. And lastly, before I ask my first question, and, and then we'll have some we'll have a discussion, and then Abagunde will ask her first question. I wanted to say that how much this work resonated with my, the work I did for um, my first book in Lagos, Nigeria, where I was working with Cuban and Brazilian repatriates, communities there, and that there's this really beautiful memorias about Brazil in Nigeria, in Lagos, and how these these memories are, are vibrant and alive and they move in multiple directions. So I really want to thank you for doing doing this work. So this is my first question. There was this wonderful quote by the children of Baba Falefa, where um, I believe it's one of his daughters says, I've always felt deep inside of me, my father's not dead. He is alive in me, more alive than ever. I was wondering how this kind of active live connection to the songs, the ancestors, how this affected how you understood the work you were doing with the community and in the film and if so, how did it shape um, the the film itself? Oh, uh, okay, Sully and Abegunde, thank you so much. Uh, we are uh, all the three of us, Casio, Gabriel, and I, extremely happy to be here with you, with you, even virtually. And that's an honor for us to be sharing with all of you this experience. It's uh, the result of eight years of research that started there at, in Bloomington in 2012. And uh, it's been uh, a long path that uh, took these 329 aluminum discs and that content that has been extremely well preserved at the archives of traditional music. And first of all, I need to uh, warmly thank all the people who work at the archives uh, in the Department of Ethnomusicology, all my colleagues, Dr. Alan Burdett, who is the director of the archives. And because without this participation, this collaboration over eight years, nothing of this could have happened. So first of all, uh, it's very important to acknowledge how important has been the participation of Indiana University in these eight years experience. And uh, for, from the very beginning, when I arrived in Bloomington in 2012, and I listened for the first time the recordings of Martinien de Bonfin and Minier de Grantois, uh, it was a very strong experience for me after 28 years in Brazil, uh, uh, sharing my life with Canoble people. So I immediately understood what, how important it would be for all the descendants and the people in Bahia we belong to Canomble traditions and uh, in a larger sense to many people in the Brazilian community. We have more than 51% of black people in whole Brazil, more than 75% of blacks here in Bahia. And uh, the place we live here in Reconcavo, in the Bay of All Saints around Salvador is more than 80 to 85% blacks. So, uh, it matters on not only to Konobe worshippers, but to everybody here. 
and the presence you mentioned, Soli, about uh, uh, Falefa's daughter, and when she's deeply touched by the presence of her father through the recordings, has showed and appeared to us on every encounter we had uh, through pictures, because Lorenzo Turner uh, did wonderful, they took wonderful photographs, and they're there in Washington at the Anacosta Community Museum. And uh, we uh, observed that the sound was uh, usually even stronger than photographs. So the mm. presence of the voice of, the, of these people, uh, of Maimini Nia, Manuel Falefa, Martinian du Bonfin, Josin Dagomea, to these people who have uh, a direct relationship of blood or spiritual belonging and spirituality and ancestry uh, has touched him deeply. So yes, after a few seconds after this emotional moment that uh, Takuira had about her father, uh, we had to cut because she went to a trance and it was a very private moment. And uh, it was a very beautiful moment that obviously it was only shared with us and we agreed that it would be better to keep it uh, for her. Yes. Exclusively. So yes, this ancestral presence uh, seems to flow within every second of these recordings. And that's what they matter. And that's why obviously uh, we believe that this, their second life would occur when they finally, after almost eight years, would meet again with mm. these amazing and wonderful people in Bahia. And that's exactly when we went to the archives of the uh, correspondences of Dr. Turner in Northwestern University. He, that was his will, not only to publish these recordings, which he, is, mm. he was not able to do, and to take them back to Brazil, which also mm. he was not able to do. And uh, just remembering what Abegundi said, Yes, Dr. Turner was a pioneer. He came to Bahia and did wonderful fieldwork way before Pierre Verger and Melvin Herskovitz. But as an African-American scholar, his work until recently, until today, for some, is not recognized as right. it, used, it, it should be. And uh, that's not by chance that his work has not been recognized so much over time. Uh, the same way in Brazil, in the same way in the United States. Thank you. Absolutely, yes. Cassio, would you like to say something? Good evening to you all. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to meet you, uh, Soli and Abegudi. Nice to meet you. I'm truly looking forward to know your research better. Uh, yes. Uh, that specific moment you mentioned uh, at the film it was uh, so uh, amazing uh, for us. Uh, we could feel the atmosphere. We, we could feel that she's uh, Takuira. She's a, a very sensitive person. We met her just uh, a few days before that that day, but we we decided she had. Uh, we have, we have to have her uh, on the movie also. And uh, she, in fact, she receives, uh, she incorporates Oshun at that moment. So it was very uh, touching for us all. Uh, but we talked to Gabriela then during the, the, the editing after the, the film, the, the filming, and we decided to, that that moment was uh, uh, a part of another world, a spiritual world, uh, and we'd like to to show in this in this movie just the this cross between worlds. That's what uh, we thought we think that could be the most interesting part. And, and I would just add that the. Also, the, the, not only the photographies, but uh, the music and the, the singing uh, of the ancestors and many, uh, many years before, 
uh, recorded many years before. Uh, that is that is an important thing that connects uh, these two worlds. Uh, you know, that's uh, what I would like to add. Uh, I think Gabriela could could add something. Yes, uh, please, Gabriela. I I'll just translate to her in, in a few words. Gabriela. Uh, você quer fazer sua sua primeira fala só tocando e cantando? So say. yes, uh, Gabriel does speak English, so we'll try. We'll have to translate any question and to translate the answers. But first, as a Bahian woman deeply rooted in our culture, she would like to welcome us with Berimbau and a song by herself. She will, Gabriel. aos nossos ancestrais a memória afro-atlântica por isso que eu achei importante cantar e tocar um instrumento também tão ancestral como a língua de matriz afro também né? que a gente encontra muito aqui no Candomblé da Bahia Axé okay. so, uh, Gabriela said that she played and sung this music because it, uh, it's all about going back to Africa. And this is deeply related to the Afro-Atlantic world and the ancestors in the ancestry and these very ancient instrument, the Bidimbao, that brings us directly back to Africa. Thank you. I would like to invite my uh, uh, co-host, co-moderator, Abagunde, to ask a question. Thank you, Soli. So you actually answered um, part of the first question that I had, which was really about the relevancy of, of the work, not um, to, to us, but in the world and to the communities. I'm really very conscious of the fact that right now, because of the pandemic and because of so many things happening, that there are scholars and particularly students who are wondering about the relevancy of their work. But I think that you've spoken um, to that um, very much. So thank you so much. So I, I have a question. Um, and so at, you know, let me know if it is not clear. So one of the things that I'm, I'm very struck by is the your intent, the intent of um, all of you to return this 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 history, this memory, right? The material archives to the communities themselves, right? And it was really amazing to sit and watch people listen to the voices of their own family members, perhaps that whom they've not heard for a long time, right? To sing, to see these worlds meld over time and space and dimension through the memory. So it got me to thinking about the body as a site of memory, right? The body is a primary archive, 
right? The movement, the dance, how one embodies um, this work as well as spirit and as well as ancestors. So I'm really curious because you've also spoken about how Ashun manifested, right? And how some other things manifested, I'm sure. So I'm really curious about um, as you were doing that, how do you experience and how do you understand, how do you see this material archive that you're in returning to the community? How is it merging with the body archive that they have, right? How are they making space for that? And how are they through what it is that is now being shared in community? How is that being transmitted to the younger generation? Because we see a number of younger people right, who are playing um, the drums, but we don't hear them speaking, right? So I'm curious, how is this material archive that's being returned, how is the body as the site of memory, as an archive, how is it making space for that particular information? And how is that being transmitted to a younger generation? So, <clears throat> uh, yes, once again, uh, we have the certainty that uh, the format in which we would try to bring everything back through the process of repatriation, uh, we're talking about obviously uh, intangible uh, heritage. So, because some of some people here in Brazil asked asked us about the discs, if we would bring the discs back, the originals. And we explained that first, uh, they were extremely well kept for almost 80 years and for more than 40, 50 years in, in, at the Indiana University and, what, and the digitization had been made. And so uh, that's very interesting to understand that there was, uh, oh, uh, some people wanted the, the physical material and then understood that obviously what was in it that was extremely precious so to uh all the people that we've been interacting over the, these last five six years i would say seven even seven years uh bringing these re recordings back and trying to find the people that were still alive uh it brought not only the memory of people who already went and in the other world, but uh, also obviously a, a very precious uh, material of hundreds and hundreds of songs and tales and myths and stories told. Um, we have 53 uh, hours of recordings and only now maybe six or seven year, uh, hours that have, have been uh, published in forms of digital uh, formats for the communities in 3,000 uh, uh, CDs and, and books. So uh, the, uh, there is, I think there is two levels, the extremely emotional levels for people, and then the reconnection with uh, lingu linguistic structures uh, which allowed them to uh, to hear how it was sung by that time and what is the difference or how different does it sound between now and then. And then the body responds. So there is a extremely very immediate, uh, instantly connection between the fact of listening and, and experiencing the body. So even if we don't see that so much in the film because we were interviewing people. Many times I went to many terreros of Canomblé and the people started to dance and to bodily react uh, to the material and to enact through the dance and through many gesture and interaction between themselves. Casio? Uh, regarding the question, uh, I believe that the, uh, I think you 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 asked uh, about the younger generations, and I think they have the most important role in this uh, in receiving in this uh, 
heritage, we are talking about a digital heritage. Uh, I remember we talked to, to Alan, the director of the Archives of Traditional Music, and uh, we visit the MDPI and we, we got to know all the efforts and they helped us a lot uh, with sh uh, sharing archives and digital uh, remastered archives uh, of the Lorenzo Turner's recordings. And I believe this, uh, we talked to Alan and he, he told us uh, it's, a, it's a process that is ongoing that all the archives in the world and in institutions like the Archives of Traditional Music are, are digitizing their, their uh, collections. And so uh, that let me uh, think about that we are in this uh, moment that the archives are also in movement. So uh, we're not uh, stuck in time, but uh, we have to think of, of, about a variety of formats just uh, to reach the new generations uh, that are in a much uh, higher speed of knowledge and, and absorbing knowledge. So that's how we, we thought about organizing this uh, digital repatriation that uh, Xavier uh, just mentioned. And we thought about books, not only physical books, but ebooks, uh, digital album, albums on the YouTube channel. Uh, and also the most, I think, the most important uh, means that is the documentary film, the audiovisual uh, format. So I think this is uh, how we are dealing with the, I consider it's a mission, uh, uh, this re all this repatriation process for us, uh, it's, a, it's a mission, it's a mission. Uh, I'd like to just to, I have this here. This is the second, second book, Memorias Afro-Atlanticas, and this is the first book. Uh, we, we, every week we receive uh, uh, emails and messages from people around the world, especially uh, people from Brazil and people from different Tejeros in Brazil and they all want to access those archives and they all want to know about the the project and they also they also want to watch the, the, the film so i think this is an, an ongoing process and that's uh, how we try to be in contact with the new generations especially in the candomblé communities and I just remember Gabriela a few uh, few years ago. I mean, I think two years ago, she also directed a, a, a music series about uh, uh, how music uh, affects the lives of younger people in 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 Bahia. I'll, I'll, I'll translate to her and let her with the speech. Gabi. Uh, a gente está falando aqui sobre como as novas gerações é, acessam essas informações musicais que a gente vem compartilhando. E aí eu acabei de comentar que eu lembrei da série Música da Minha Vida, né? Que você, que você dirigiu e aí talvez você pode acrescentar algo, algo nesse sentido. Falar um pouco da sua experiência nessa, nesse trabalho e o que é que você acha desse... De, Disso, né? de como as novas gerações veem esse, esse legado. Okay. Som, o som, o som, Gabriela. Oi, ok. É, minha filmografia é muito em cima, eu acho assim, da musicalidade baiana. Então, desde o 
momento que eu ainda era estudante de cinema, eu já vinha fazendo cinema musical, digamos assim. Né? E aí, é, minha primeira pesquisa foi com samba de roda, né? depois veio com a capoeira, a musicalidade da capoeira também, e aí, na sequência, uma série que, da TV nacional que fala sobre a musicalidade baiana, como a música é, salva vidas, né? como a arte da dignidade à vida dos jovens também, que a partir da, através da arte eles é, conseguem fugir da vida é, marginalizada e é isso. E, e nessa reta final né, dessa minha filmografia, chegando até o Memórias, a gente entende que dentro dessa história, da minha trajetória, a musicalidade vem costurando e trazendo a filmografia, né, para dentro da minha trajetória no cinema. Fala, Cássio. Fala mais? O Cássio já traduz. Traduzir. Uh, so she says uh, uh, she has a, a focus on her work about the the musical, the popular music of Bahia and how the, the, the black communities in, uh, in Bahia, how they feel the music and how, and how the art, the, the popular music can save lives. Because uh, as you know, we, we have uh, uh, lots uh, of problems with racism and conflicts and uh, there's uh, this, uh, I think, uh, sorry. Uh, so, sorry. Uh, and and she, she says the, the art can save lives in the black communities, okay? And, I would, like, I would like to add something like to add. very, uh, I think Gabriel just said, yes, ours can save lives. And uh, I would like to say uh, the following. Uh, I, I came to Brazil 28 years ago from France and I didn't return. I mean, only to do my PhD, but I, I decided my option was to live in Bahia. And uh, that's not the option that most of my colleagues from anthropology or ethnomusicology, or ethnomusicology too. And so this work, uh, Afro-Atlantic Legacies, was all about giving back what usually uh, researchers do the contrary. We take and take away. And this is one of the first thing that people uh, uh, struggle to get back in the communities is something back and most of times there's nothing. So it, uh, I felt like a mission to bring this material back to these communities. And all this work all, all over the last eight years has been done uh, mainly, if not only being made for the Canomblé community. Because when we say that uh, art can save life here in Brazil, we have to remember that 65,000 people are killed every year in this country and 77% of them are Blacks. And uh, this is the Black Consciousness Day, as we know today here in Brazil, and hundreds of Blacks may have died today in complete anonymity. So Canoblé uh, people are being persecuted by new Pentecostal churches who that uh, are together with this Bolsonaro uh, government. And so on a daily basis, for years and years, since the very beginning and now worse than ever in Brazil, Canoblé people and all people who belong to Afro-Brazilian religions are being persecuted and they fear for their life. So uh, giving back this material and having these books and having these recordings and having the film and the following film we're about to make is something that is extremely valuable to them. 
And uh, I, I must say that I've never thought in these last eight years about academia. I didn't want to write articles to have a good CV. No, I only wanted to publish this material and to have it back to these people uh, who are on a constant and daily basis are suffering. And uh, they are suffering because they're poor, because they're Blacks, and because they have a religion that came from Africa and was brought by enslaved Africans. And it's worse than ever. So uh, that's the urgency about doing ethnomusicology in this specific situation here in Brazil. Thank you. I, I wanna thank you for saying that um, very, very much and in that particular, that particular manner. So I, I'll come back because I was solely had I was just gonna thank as well and, and say how that resonates so much with the history of persecution in Candomblé and in many of the, in, in Lukumi and many of the Afro-Atlantic religions. So I think it's so important that it's the, the, bringing those ancestors back to the community as a resource is very much, um, or they're there already, but having that interconnection is so important. I actually w wanted, if, this, if it's okay with Abogunde, to hear a little bit more about the second project that is connected to this first project and how it might be continuing this work. Yeah. I would like to do that and to, and let me tell you one of the reasons why before you um, do that, going back to the very first question that Soli asked you and the question that I had about relevancy, because one of the things that I think that you are doing and what you're saying and in the formats that you're choosing, um, I'm always interested in how the work in the academy that we do is not only contemplative, but actually helps to restructure our understanding of what research is, right? And so I think that, you know, as you're talking about this like the, the model a possible model like who gets the materials right we do do our work in communities um you know like many of us work who don't are not able to read the work that we um write in in english and that was important to me in working in itaparica but just what, as you're talking about this next project and this like how is this challenging and how is it helping us to restructure what we consider to be research, what it considers to be um, valuable, you know, what it can, what is considered to be of importance, right, and to whom? Yes, so I'll answer and just right away, Pastor Cassio. Um, so I must say that uh, when I came back to Bahia, I've been after many, many uh, source of Financement to be able to publish something. And it took me two, three years of frustration uh, because politically speaking, it was not so interesting for even the government here to publish this material. And then we met Casio and I, and Casio has been a five, six years companion on this uh, path of trying to have uh, people paying for this material. And it was just so fundamental. As an ethnomusicologist, we had the same view on our field and how we are trained to interact with community. And then we met Gabriela. And Gabriela brought us uh, the perspective of cinema and how important it would be to reach a broader audience. So I think the three steps, uh, getting together, for, forming a team, as a research, uh, as an ethnomusicologist, I've been 25 years alone. I, I've never, I've ne I had never worked with a team, you know. And we had 15 people on the film working with us, so that was just very amazing. But to answer Abegunde, I think that I could have published two or three important, maybe papers. But who uh, would have read them within the community? Who? So really, our focus was. Uh, mainly on Canomblé, and then people within academia got interested. I mean, some people, <laughs> and in the United States as well, and in Brazil. When you both talked about the language Ukraine, which I've seen for the first time in Bloomington, which is amazing. So obviously I thought, wow, how beautiful it is. And then I met Cynthia Schmidt, who should be maybe listening to us now. And we met in Indianapolis at the SAM conference. and she encouraged us to do the same in Bahia. So all these steps 
uh, have been very helpful. And truly, I think that one of the key uh, when we speak about going back to com the community and making this material go back to them is money also. So we need, needed this money. Nothing has been sold. We are just giving back and it says it's been published and it's obviously free for all the Canobli communities and all the people within academia in Brazil and the United States or Europe. We've sent some, uh, some copies, but it's all, all online also. And we have more than 4,000 or 400,000 accesses on the internet. Uh, and so that was an all, uh, an all already also uh, a key that Casio has thought about the importance of having the internet through our mainstream like YouTube and SoundCloud. Great, uh, uh, Xavier. Uh, I would like I would add that not only uh, four hundred thousand access in our uh, websites uh, or YouTube pages, but also uh, 160, over 160 tracks published. Uh, and all the, those tracks are just a part of the work of Lorenzo Turner. And uh, also two, uh, two important, the most important uh, cinema festivals in Brazil, uh, the film has taken part and this week next week uh, the film is going to be uh, uh, it's it, it's a premiere of the the afro-atlantic legacies in another important festival cinema festival in brazil and we've we've been uh working on the next step that uh consists on uh, the production of a second documentary film. I would say we are going to walk into new directions, focusing not only on the language aspects, but uh, and also, of course, the personality, the kind of black personalities involved in uh, that journey, journey for uh, in the 40s, but also including a deeper look at the music aspects. Uh, I would say, uh, what musical impacts those recording could have, and they we see this in reality. Uh, what impacts uh, those recording inside the colonial communities and their rituals? Uh, we are interested how my, how in how the music of colonial got so uh, attached to the popular music in Bahia, also. Uh, Xavier had published some uh, papers about this before. And we have a list of artists of popular music in Bahia we'd love to interview and to show them uh, some of these recordings. Uh, many of them never heard about it. And we'd like to show them uh, and capture their reactions and interactions on camera. And soon though, we are going to release this second movie. Gabriela? Oi. O Cássio, não sei o que você estava falando, mas enfim. Cássio, Gabriela, a gente estava falando também sobre a importância de que foi nosso encontro. É, com você no sentido de poder juntar a imagem, fazer um filme, o quanto o nosso encontro com você, eu, Cássio, com você, e depois, obviamente, toda uma equipe, foi fundamental para dar uma outra envergadura a essa, a essa caminhada, fazendo um filme através de arquivos sonoros, de fotografias, e como isso assim se transformou em um filme. Talvez você pode falar sobre isso. Então, é, primeiro eu quero agradecer aqui que eu comecei, né, fiz uma saudação primeiro aos nossos antepassados, nossos ancestrais, e quero agradecer aqui aos participantes por estar aqui também, e é, agradecer aqui é, a produção da Coraça, e seja o Cássio por ter acreditado no meu olhar, no olhar feminino de uma mulher negra, 
né? tentando é, passar para a tela a emoção de como é sentir a memória afetiva através da musicalidade, dos registros de Lorenzo Tanner né? é, e as fotografias sentimento que tem as cantigas e rezas do candomblé. Então, esse filme e a nossa conexão é muito importante para... Eu aprendi com esse filme, com a nossa conexão, que o meu futuro é o meu passado. E esse filme me fez dar muito mais valor à nossa ancestralidade. Eu agradeço a você e a Cássio por ter me dado essa oportunidade de ter... É feito dessa história uma imagem, um documentário. So, thank you, Gabriel. Gabriel was talking about her experience of making this film with us, starting from our digital sound archives and photographs to making a movie, a film. So she said that uh, most likely her view and experience as a black woman from Bahia and her sensitivity and the relationship she has with our culture was fundamental. And I can fully agree with that. And uh, she experienced through uh, the last two or three years with us, this reconnection with something that was not uh, so patent, but obviously so deeply rooted in her experience. And uh, she said something which is I discovered that my future is my past. And I think it tells a lot about this connection between ancestry and who we are today. I actually had a question about Tim. Oh, but Brittany's here. So we will take some questions from the audience. <laughs> we can go back and forth. So hold that question. I'd still love for you. I will. I'd still love for you to ask it. Um, all right. Uh, the first question, Daniel asks, would you like to comment about the Nina Nina do, do Gantoas song uh, in the film and Dorival Kaimi's song? Well, yes, it's a way to answer to both, to both questions because you told us about the next movie. And so the next film will be uh, filming in January if the pandemic allows us, uh, is about the connection and the influence of Canomli music on Brazilian popular music. And it's a very deep and profound connection for many, many decades. So Doriva Caymmi was an amazing composer in Bahia and deeply rooted in these traditions. It has been like a bridge between Canomli in some ways in the popular culture. So yes, obviously there is a deep link in these a uh, specific song to my Meninia uh, shows how these figures like Meninia are also in the uh, collective unconsciousness of Brazil, uh, regardless of the color, and especially here in Bahia. So the next film will be exactly on trying to connect all these ancient recordings made in 1940 by Lorenzo Turner, and then going to uh, famous artists like Gilberto Gil and so many others, and to ask them uh, what they feel about these recordings and how Candomblé music has influenced their music uh, through their career. Uh, wow, we just had a flood of questions, so hopefully we can get through all of these. Uh, Amina asks, thank you, thank you for such an eye-opening conversation. I have a general question. I was wondering if there are plans to project the documentary in Nigeria or in Angola. Obrigado and merci. Castro? Wow, uh, yes, we have plans. Uh, we, we still don't have funding for... Uh, <laughs> turning these plans reality, but it's yes. Uh, we know that Dr. Turner's uh, work extended to Africa, to Nigeria, and Benin, and, and also uh, we just started to to listen to these recordings and to. Uh, so this is it's possibly a next step for for the project, and maybe. Uh, getting external international funds for this 
would be very help helpful. I, I, I read a, uh, another question about uh, if the, the book CD sets are available for, for uh, purchase. No, uh, we, we give preference to Candomblé communities for in this distribution uh, and they receive it for free. Uh, but uh, we can uh, have some some books only books uh, sent uh, by mail by post and uh, if uh, someone can can uh, assume the, the costs of sending this. Okay. Oh, and it's important to note that the we can send the ebooks for free and you can easily find the ebooks online. So it's completely free and it's exactly the same in ebook format. And same for the uh, recordings, it's all uh, on SoundCloud, on the Memorias Afro Atlanticas. So we can send the links and uh, there's everything online. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Um, I'll ask one more question and then Soli, if we can go back to your question that you're holding on, I, I'd love to get to that. Um, Lori asks, is there pressure from the Brazilian government or other sources not to do this work, especially in light of the discrimination you mentioned uh, earlier? Uh, well, exactly when I came back from Bloomington in 2013, uh, some colleagues very uh, involved in the Afro-Brazilian research and from Bahia and from different places in Brazil told me, you must go to the national IFAM the National Institute for Cultural Heritage. And obviously with such an amazing archive, they will publish it. I mean, there's no way they wouldn't. And they didn't. Uh, it took us, it took me three years trying and trying and trying and nothing. So uh, the pressure is only by not giving their support. And that's how uh, I went to Casio and Casio was you know, an amazing key for us, going after every, every uh, possibility we could find. And so, uh, yes, I think this is a form of pressure and it was in 2013, 14, 15. It would be much worse now under Bolsonaro. So that's a challenge for us. Mm -hmm. uh, so Lee, do you wanna ask your question and we'll let a few more audience questions come in. Sure. Um, my question actually relates to Gabriela's wonderful, beautiful comments about time. Um, I had a question. Uh, did working on this film m make you reconsider your notions of temporality of time in relation to culture? And if so, how, how would that change um, the way that you do your research, the way that you make film, the way that you understand history? Um, I was because watching the film made made me really think about time and culture and its relationships so Gabriela é só ele quer saber em que de que, em que medida né a partir do que você falou sobre o tempo né o seu passado o seu futuro essa temporalidade e a relação da temporalidade com a sua cultura é, pode ter mudado a sua perspectiva sobre o seu trabalho é, com essa experiência do filme É, eu digo que não só com o meu trabalho, mas com a minha vida. Tocou espiritualmente na minha alma esse filme. Porque, é, apesar de ter tido uma educação evangélica, me fez aprender, respeitar muito mais esse filme, o povo de santo, e entender que realmente a minha cultura, a minha fonte, está ali no axé. Né? e não no lado cristão que fomos doutrinados aqui no Brasil, né? que tentaram apagar a nossa memória. Isso fez clarear a minha mente e a minha memória esse filme. Então, vai além do meu trabalho, é para a vida, é mais profundo, é transcendental. So, uh, Gabriela said that this film touched a soul and then made her rethink the, her relationship to her personal story because she comes from an evangelical family and 
So uh, it was like a deep change for her to reconnect mm. what is uh, most likely, obviously, our deeper ancestry. And so, yes, it was a shock and she was able to reconnect with that, something that has been uh, taken away in some parts because of a religious affiliation she had before mm -hmm. and from her family. Que lindo, obrigado. All right, let's ask another question from the audience. Um, Alan, who is the director of the Archives of Traditional Music, I believe uh, this question is coming from. Uh, first, a comment. Thanks to all who are part of creating this wonderful, important, and beautiful film. When you started making this film, you had a complex story to tell, one that weaves together people of the past and present, connected by these archival recordings and a scholar with his own story. What helped guide you as the team made decisions about the overall narrative of the film? Yes. Well, uh, thank you for the question, Alan. Uh, I think uh, what guided guided us from the beginning, uh, I think, was the similarity of uh, histories and personal history. I I mean, Dr. Turner's personal history uh, uh, relates to to many of uh, uh, black people, and black person uh, in in Brazil trajectories. So uh, and also uh, we are in the Afro Atlantic legacy uh, film. We are we were focusing more on the language aspect and how those languages uh, could connect in different ways of singing and uh, and how these recordings would uh, be listened to uh, for uh, by that those those uh, descendants descendants of those peoples who were actually recorded in the 40s so and Gabriela brought this this link to for us to show the pictures um, and and also to 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 show them the, the music the, their musics their community musics and then uh, we got all that uh, emotional reactions and uh, and that that was that was what guided us uh, during the narrative, I think. I'm going to ask one more audience question, and then uh, Abagunde, did you have one more question as well? I do, yes. Okay, wonderful. Uh, James asks, can one of you speak to specific differences between songs as they were recorded by Turner and the way that they are performed by practitioners now? Are there consistent changes that happen in terms of melodic or rhythmic structures? Furthermore, how do performance inconsistencies introduce challenges to local individuals who, whose power rests in part on being conduits of history and tradition? It seems as though repatriation might facilitate contestations to gerontocratic power. Well, uh, I think the biggest difference we've been uh, seeing is in linguistic terms. Mm -hmm. So the way people uh, perform and speak these songs uh, has changed in some ways and th that's why it's it's kind of cold mind for many people within Canobly because it's very interesting for them to see the difference between then and now. Uh, also I think the most important is that many uh, songs have been lost and so people are reconnecting with the heritage that so, or only very, very few people had. Uh, there is no very, uh, I wouldn't say there is a big change in rhythmic structure. Uh, on melodic points, something that ha I had also already seen in other recordings from the 1950s is uh, a switch from pentatonic scales to heptatonic scales. 
which is common in these. I think Cuba had the same in some ways uh, because of the influence of Occidental Western music over the decades through radio and many things. So the way people sing, and if you uh, pay attention, you can see that there is a switch from pentatonic African scales to more heptatonic scales. And the constant contestations, uh, I've not seen yet, and I, uh, it may be one consequence. I mean, when you go back and forth and when you're just like kind of messenger, I, I, I've lived with Pierre Verger, Pierre Verger, Pierre Fatoumbi Verger was a French uh, anthropologist and photographer. And he went back and forth from the Gulf of Benin in Africa and Bahia maybe 20, 30 times over the decades. And so he was la like a messenger between all these two parts, Africa and Brazil. And I knew by taking this material back that in a way I would do something very little, but uh, that could be compared to this back and forth movement. And so we had uh, amazing meetings with Quinquet and the Gullah people in the Sea Islands. And we have to understand that this Afro-Atlantic uh, legacy is not only between Africa and Brazil or Africa and the United States, but it's in between. And so between North and South, between the United States, Cuba, uh, the West Indies, the Caribbean and Brazil, there is a deep connection. I, uh, before the, the pandemics for many years, I've been receiving students from different HBCUs here in Bahia, from different universities. And I thrive to strengthen uh, the link between not only academics uh, and people from academia in Brazil and in Bahia, but obviously we have a plan to bring Quinquet here in Bahia. We hope to find money <laughs> for that. And we want to take the people from Bahia to the Sea Islands because it's deeply connected. I mean, the food, the way people speak, the way people behave. So we need to connect these communities, not only for cultural reasons, but for political reasons. I mean, we've been talking for the last six months about uh, George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter here in Brazil. But there, you need to know how these hundreds and hundreds of young black men that are killed every day. And so their names must be said, just like the names of George Floyd. And I believe that the connection between these two countries and the experience uh, in the Caribbean, in the United States and Brazil will strengthen uh, the Black Lives Matter movement on both sides. And I think it's very important. And I think that the Afro-Atlantic world is there for that, for struggling against oppression, against prejudice, against extermination and genocide. Mm. Very important connection. Uh, Abu Gunday, do you want to ask your question? Yes, I had a question, but now I have 10,000 other questions. So <laughs> let me get this um, in my head. So here is one of the things um, that I'm thinking about this documentary, again, in the sense of thinking uh, about the language you cry and right? the kinds of shifts that people are being asked to make, right? So shifts in our understanding of, of, of history. I'm thinking from a Black Studies scholar perspective, right, in our understanding of the discipline about the multiple types of diasporas, um, uh, the ways in which that communities have traveled and migrated between worlds and continents for a very, very long time, right? And so one of the things that I think that the documentary does do well, among other things, is to show us in the 19th century, early 20th century, the lack of the divisions between nations, right? The, the fluidity, the learning of one nation's language, the learning of one nation's movements, and song, so this shifting. And so in the back of my head, I, I want to know like from you all, and maybe this is too big for, you know, for right now, what is it as you were doing this work, what did you learn that made you have to shift your understanding or unlearn your understanding of who Africans were, right? Brazil is a very central part in the world of where nations come together, where nations merge together, right? But it's not always seen as that. So what in all of that fluidity, right? The fluidity of language and being and migration, um, particularly I think between women, Yoruba women, you know, back and forth in Brazil, um, what had to shift for you or what shifted for you 
to make you go even deeper into um, this project, right? What did you have to unlearn about Africans and Africans in Bahia and Africans in the world? And what do we need to have shift? So uh, I think, um, well, for scholars, we study Canonblé and Afro-Cuban uh, religions maybe in some ways the same. Uh, we have this clear distinction of nations of the Bantu world and the Nago Yoruba world as something so different. And obviously we know also by history and the history of our uh, discipline that it's been introduced also by scholars. I mean, the hierarchy that has been made between Bantu Africans and Yoruba and so I would say that the, uh, an amazing difference is what you said Abegunde that uh, the nations 50 60 years ago are uh, were much more intertwined and interpenetrated and so they had very mutual influences and people respected one another on the basis of, of acknowledgement that they they have a common Africanity and they could fluidly go from one place to the other and when someone has to had to be initiated you made the curry divination and you said no that's not with us because you're bantu so you need to go there and uh because maybe of oppression and because of the struggle for existing over the ne next decades until today we see a movement of separation of the nations of re-bantuization that i've witnessed over the last 25 years 30 years that uh, separates Bantu, Kongwangwala nations from Yoruba Nago, and they don't want to be mixed up anymore. Uh, and so I think that it brings uh, an important reflection, which have witnessed for Kanoble people on their practice, and today how they can gather and unite more, uh, thinking that obviously the, 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 the threat is outside. The threat is from the political world, is from this government. And uh, someone asked about what kind of persecution. So this is very hard persecution on people, on Colombia houses, on destroying Colombia houses, on throwing stones to people, on discriminating children at school, on discriminating, discriminating professors at schools. So that's not only words, that's act, and that's oppression on a daily basis. So I think this union that they had in the past on, in some aspects in these international canomble may come back someday, soon, I hope, I guess, maybe. I would like to, to add to this, uh, to this question uh, that uh, not only I, I had to learn about more about audiovisual production because I, I come from the music production but uh, it's a fascinating world the audiovisual production uh, and filmmaking but uh, I'm not I'm not talking about this I, I was uh, thinking of one of the speeches of uh, Valmir Pereira who is in the in the film and he says uh, what if Dr. Turner's didn't find uh, the Tejeros open in the 40s in that time, uh, open to a visit and open uh, to show and share their, uh, their community and the way of life. So I, that, that, uh, that uh, speech uh, of Valmi uh, let me think about uh that i always thought about resistance and the resistance in the candomblé uh, for all these years all the centuries uh, as a suffering resistance for struggling or fighting but i now i i i i can understand that is a proud resistance it's a, a very proud movement that where we are proud to show our culture, uh, 
and we are proud to show our way of life in our community. And that proud, that's, uh, that's what makes us stronger. So that's, I think uh, I learned this from this film. Gabriela quer acrescentar, ela perguntou o que você aprendeu nesse filme uh, que uh, é, que é algo que você aprendeu que tem a ver com a cultura e o conhecimento das culturas africanas e isso. É, esse filme é uma para mim foi uma escola, porque eu aprendi tanta coisa, até eu estou aprendendo com esse filme, né? Inclusive, aprendi a respeitar o silêncio, né? Onde a gente... É, com o silêncio a gente consegue fazer a nossa, nossa conexão, né? Os orixás também, não só com a musicalidade, mas também fazendo a nossa conexão de alma espiritual. E aí, com esse filme... E, e é isso. É, e vem a questão da, das línguas, né? De Brisaf, que foi uma das coisas que eu acho que foi mais importante assim, para mim, né? respeitar e entender as nossas origens, né? Fazer a voltar de novo. Por isso que eu falo é, que meu futuro é meu passado. Foi isso que eu aprendi com o filme. Além de estar tá conectada com todas as personagens, mãe menininha, Manuel Lefá, Martiniano, né? Joãozinho da Gomeia, entender também o posicionamento, a importância de cada um deles dentro da cultura afro-brasileira. Okay, I'll translate it. Uh, she says in a few words, uh, she learned how to respect the silence. And also she learned a lot about Uh, the variety of languages, and she didn't know about it, uh, and and how to connect uh, with the personalities and uh, priests and priestess who are in the uh, in the story of Candomblé in Bahia. Uh, well, speaking of languages, we have an audience question. Uh, Ricardo asks, in the documentary, a linguistics teacher speaks of the serious lack of interest in languages in Brazil. Does the situation continue like this, or is there a movement trying to correct this lack of interest? No, I think the, the lack of interest to African languages and Amerindian native Brazilian languages is the same. Uh, like these amazing ethnolinguists says in the film uh, because they are, are they are languages of orality uh, that are not written and academia usually doesn't care or doesn't get so much interest and obviously behind that there is racism again uh, because these are the languages of indians like they are so-called indians like so many brazilians see them and uh, black people. So, for example, we uh, created our university here 16 years ago under President Lula presidency. And as the dean of my campus, the first dean, I tried to implement a program of African languages. And uh, it was denied by my colleagues, <laughs> even in the scope of social sciences and Brazilian people. So uh, I was shocked. And even as the dean, I couldn't overturn. So we don't have this program. And that tells a lot. We had the Center for Oriental and African Languages that was 
created in the 1950s, 1960s. And uh, the, the son of Manuel Falifa speaks about that. And then it disappeared. So we don't have so much. I mean, in African languages, the center still exists, but the programs are very weak, if not existent. Mm -hmm. So no, the, 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 this is the same problem. And the one person that has been designated to the Fundação Palmares, which is the foundation that represents black people in this country, the cultural foundation of the government, representing with the name of Zumba, Zumbi dos Palmares, which is the name of the slave that go into rebellion uh, towards slavery at the end of the 17th century and was killed. And that's why we have the Black Consciousness Day today. So this foundation is held by someone who claims there is no racism in Brazil and all these, all these black people that they, are, they were re, 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 uh, making reference before need to be forgotten because it's not important. We need to celebrate uh, police officers, black police officers. That's what he said today. So the problem is, is deepening, I would say. Well, I want to ask you all for your final thoughts uh, before we wrap, but I, I do want to get to um, Queen Ket, the brilliant Queen Ket who's featured in the film has asked a question. Um, when will the film be shown to the Gullah Geechee Nation? So uh, Queen Ket is an amazing and struggling and inspiring woman who represents the Gullah Geechee community for more than two decades. And uh, so we met in uh, South Carolina and St. Helena Highland last year. And so we are planning together with Quinquet and we'll get in touch these days, who knows, maybe tomorrow, that in the Black History Month in February, mm -hmm. we should have a screening. So depending on the pandemic, it could be presential or virtual, but we'll for sure have these uh, the film exhibited in February for the Black History Month uh, with Queen Quet and the Girl at Geechee Sea Island Coalition that she represents. Mm, that's wonderful. We'll keep keep us all posted on that. So yes, we, we will. Share, especially if it's virtual. Um, so a, a, as I said, I would love to uh, offer each of you the opportunity to have any uh, closing thoughts uh, before we wrap tonight's uh, beautiful and, and powerful conversation. Gabriela, eh, você quer fazer suas últimas considerações? E aí eu traduzo. É a conclusão. É, eu quero voltar a falar sobre o silêncio. Eu quero voltar a falar sobre o silêncio. E o que eu aprendi nesse filme foi é, ouvir mais. E para ouvir mais e sentir mais, a gente precisa estar em silêncio. Então, por isso que eu acho que é importante. É, porque, na, a partir do momento quando você vê, faz a reflexão dentro da própria cena do filme, né? Quando você vê é, as, as gerações se vendo, né? Através da fotografia, ouvindo os seus ancestrais, você percebe que esse flashback da memória vem através de um silêncio, né? Então, acho que o, o, o silêncio é algo muito importante dentro da memória afetiva que o filme traz para ela. Eu acho que a reflexão diante do filme é, é, é o silêncio, é o que eu aprendi, sabe, que ficou forte em mim foi isso. E quero agradecer é, por estar aqui é, falando um pouco da minha experiência com Memórias Afroatlânticas. Aprendi muito e estou até hoje aprendendo, buscando, tenho curiosidade de saber é, mais ainda, é, não só das, das línguas, mas também da musicalidade. Obrigada e achei So uh, Gabriela said that uh, silence may be the key word for her and of what she've, she's 
uh, learned during the film and to listen more. And when she was on the scenes of, of the film and seeing the reconnection of people alive and their uh, ancestors and the people in the past, in the 1940s, the reconnection was happening in the audition and the silence of these people trying to reconnect through memory. Mm -hmm. So it made her think about this importance of silence. And uh, she thanks you, all of us, all of you, for having the opportunity to speak about our film and sending Ashe, which is the vital energy that comes from the Yoruba, from Africa and that we have in Cuba, in Brazil, and anywhere. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. oh. Xavier, é, só para encerrar aqui, é, eu quero dizer, e diante de você, Xavier e Carlos Nobre, que eu acho importantíssimo a atitude de vocês, que não, é, não tem só fundamento, mas também é um ato político. A gente vê é, brancos contratando mulheres negras para liderar grandes projetos como esse, que foi o filme de Memória Atlântica. É isso. Eu quero deixar é, registrado essa, esse ato político aí e que continue, permaneça cada vez mais homens brancos contratando mulheres negras para liderar no cinema e qualquer outro setor. So, uh, as a final word, uh, Gabriela, I wanted to say that beyond, beyond the research and the work, there is also the political statement of uh, Cassio and I as whites, to hire a black director, a black female director, to direct this project and to be the head of the film. And that's very important. And as you know, the representativity of black people in Brazil is still a struggle. So yes, this matters to all of us. Obrigado, Gabi. <laughs> Cassio, Xavier, any, any final closing thoughts as well? Cassio? Oh, yes. Uh, well, I would like to, to thank all, all the crew uh, involved in the, in the production of the film uh, and also the production of the books and the digital albums released. Uh, and of course, all the people from the Canon Black communities who collaborated with the project we had so wonderful moments uh, together and they were amazing and very important for our lives uh, also we'd like to to thank uh Quinquet for collaborating with the film and she she was wonderful uh in the in the in the film and of course thank you suzanne Brittany, and all the iu staff and I also would include uh, the Advanced uh, Institute for Advanced Studies, the IAU Cinema, the MDPI, uh, the Department of Folklore and Ethnomusicology, and of course, the Archives of Traditional Music for all support that has been crucial to the afro projects. Uh, and, not, uh, and last but not least, uh, I'd like to thank you, Soli and Abegundi, for sharing this moment uh, tonight. And of course, Xavier and Gabriela for our partnership for the last years together in this amazing journey we've been through. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So. Um, obviously, I need to thank you all. Uh, all my life uh, here in Brazil and friends before and a small part in the United States was based on meeting amazing people and be so grateful to life for knowing so wonderful people. And I met wonderful people in Bloomington. Melanie Burnham, Portia Maltzby, Alan Burdett, Daniel Reed, and so many, many other people, Rose Stone, now Sully, now Abegunde, 
and all of you at IU Cinema, which have, I have wonderful memories there to go to this wonderful cinema. And obviously Suzanne at the Institute for Advanced Study, the constant support of the archives of traditional music. Uh, I think that $20 million have been involved in the last 10 or 15 years, uh, 10 years maybe on a program to have everything digitized on campus. And that's amazingly important. Uh, there are other recordings, other collections that need to go back to some places all around the world. And without this work, it would never be done. It would be lost. So that's very important. And then uh, these meetings like Dona Sisi, uh, which is so amazing, which I've known for 25 years when she used to live with me with Pierre Verger. So Sisi told me, and she, I think she says in the film, well, uh, everything that happened is not by chance. The Odisha is decided. So the Odisha has decided that, that someday these African-American men would come from the United States, Lorenzo Turner, and would do that work on Canomble. And some, for some reason, they chose you to bring these back. So <laughs> this gave me a huge responsibility. And uh, uh, because Cece is just like a mother to me, and she's an amazing woman, and her connection to these, as she says, DNA, and the DNA that uh, is within her body and a memory that reconnects and is reactivated when she listens to these recordings uh, is a living proof of, of how important uh, archives, which I have I had never worked before. I've always worked with people doing field work and living with people. So I was wondering how will, would I deal with that? Working in archives like an historian. Wow, strange. But uh, I found a lot of life in these archives uh, and this reconnection between the past and the present and what Gabriela said between saying that my future is my past and the importance of silence. So all of this and finding someone like Gabriela, which you, which you can see how precious she has been for us uh, during this experience has been uh, a journey and we don't want to stop then. We, we're going to struggle, Cassio and I and Gabrielle and our crew and our people to have uh, the next project and one more. And there are other recordings there at IU that we want to work on and we want to come back and be with you as soon as possible. And we want you to come here to Bahia and to see this reality, this thriving reality of Afro-Brazilian world. Thank you. Absolutely. We, we would love to have you back. So keep us posted. <laughs> uh, Soleil Abagunde, any parting thoughts? I'm just deeply grateful to be part of this conversation. And I just want to, to thank everybody on this panel um, for including me. Thank you. The same. Just thank you. Muito obrigado. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you all once again, Gabriela, Xavier, Cassio Sole Abagunde for a beautiful and necessary conversation and for being sure this film and this conversation were a part of our fall program at IU Cinema. And thank you all at home for sending in your thoughtful questions. I'd also like to thank the entire IU Cinema team, especially Seth, Will, Ava, David, Jessica, and Elena for working behind the scenes to make tonight's event possible. We'll be taking next week off from virtual events, but we'll return on Friday, December 4th with our final science on screen event of the season, a virtual screening of the new documentary Coded Bias and a post-film Q&A with IU's Center of Excellence for Women in Technology. To all of you who tuned in tonight, thank you once again for being with us. Please take care of yourselves and be kind and generous to others. Have a very good night. Goodbye.